This is the Collecting Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Purse, here with your co-host, Bill Hamill. I'm so much more comfortable collecting real estate than I am collecting other stuff. This is Collecting Real Estate. I'm your host, Stephen Purse. I'm here today with Bill Hamill. Hey, Stephen. How are you doing this morning? Great. How are you? Excellent. Thank you. Today, we're talking about 1120 Boston Lake Road. 1120 Boston Lake Road, single family house, you know, a little bit outside of uh, where I grew up and where I live. So love that location. I thought we were scaling up to a seven unit. Why are you telling me it's a single family house? (laughs) That is, uh, you never know what's going to come across that legal notice. So here we are again, as discussed in previous episodes, I'm now fixated on the local newspaper and a few other publications looking for those foreclosure legal notices. So was this a property that you wanted to hold or are you looking for flips at this point? At this point with this one, I think we were strongly considering putting this in the portfolio location was great single family that had a lot of potential and um the reason i say that we considered putting it in the portfolio is um i know we had uh two renters there and owned it for probably a year year and a half so even after going up to that seven unit, your mind wasn't telling you to stay away from the single family. You know, you got one heater and one hot water heater in the same roof. I think it was just opportunity. You just don't know what that next deal looks like. So mm-hmm. I'm still still completely comfortable with those two families that we had been purchasing and realizing the potential with foreclosure properties and getting that great deal. Um, the diamond in the rough, so to speak, you know, that, that was, that was, uh, very much my focal point every day, not only looking at that multiple listing service. Now we had legal notices to look at. That's what was really exciting at this point. Do you think that comfort and that mindset might've been different if you had the resources available today that the different podcasts and, networks of people that are quickly investing and scaling up? Absolutely. It, it's, it's a matter of just education. It, I, was, I was, I guess you can say, ignorant to the fact that larger multifamily had this potential that we know now. It's just absolute no-brainer once you warm yourself up, meaning you know, buy some small properties. I, I, I would encourage anybody to start there. But once you're comfortable with the business, managing tenants, having relationships with some banks and, and, and really getting some tools in your toolbox at that point to look at multifamily is, I, I, I think, is, is the obvious next step. All right. So take it from the expert, start small and scale up as fast as you can. You found this property in the paper. How did you fund this? How did you pay for it? This one was funded by private lender. So this was the paper in Saratoga County because this is a um, Saratoga County property, Burn Hills, Boston Lake area. And we got into this relatively inexpensively. So it was easy to line up that private lender and uh, the property wasn't in horrible condition. You know, it was, a, it was a cleanup more on the exterior, a lot of land and the first floor didn't need a whole lot of work. But what we chose to do as we owned it was take that second floor attic and actually spend a, a bit more to turn that attic into basically a, a, a suite. Meaning, um, you know, this large master bedroom studio area with a really nice full bath. Now, this is the first time you've mentioned private lending. And with my short experience, I've seen how important private lending is to make that scaling an option. How did you find your first private lender? Offering returns that were way too attractive. 
So my first private lenders were at the restaurant I worked at. So I still had that restaurant job until I was about 30. And, you know, you talk with your coworkers about what you're doing during the day. And it was common knowledge what I was doing, collecting real estate throughout the day, waiting tables at night. And as I got into these foreclosures and these types of properties to get in quickly, you know, cash is king. So I'm offering other people at my job, you know, very, very lucrative rates of return if they were willing to invest five or $10,000. Come on, give us better than that. I want to hear an interest rate. Oh my goodness. It wasn't even an interest rate. It was like, uh, you know, you give me 10,000 and I'll give you 12 back in six months. So do the math there. I don't, I don't have to do that math for anybody, but it was, you know, you know, loan shark type rates. Yeah, um, it's fun to hear about as we're at all time great rates right now. That was a learning curve for me, but, but you, you, that, that's where you start. So you know, basically I was offering very eye opening returns, you know, to coworkers. And uh, that only lasted probably for a year, year and a half. Once I realized I had better options, you know, I could go to the corner store, hard money lender and, and get a better deal than what I was, you know, um, offering coworkers. Hey, if the numbers work, whatever it takes. And that's what it was. So you said there was a bit of work on this one as well. Were you doing that work yourself? Yeah, we were still doing it. Me and Greg, that was, uh, you know, Greg actually found this property. You know, he was scaling the legal notices in Saratoga County. I was doing Albany County. So he identified this one and uh, we were off and rehabbing once again. At this point, we did see the value in getting some help. So at his job at the Clifton Park Water Authority, he had uh, friends there that, you know, had skills, you know, the type of job that people are good working with their hands and had some, you know, different levels of construction ability. So we had, you know, one or, or, or two guys at different points of the project that were helping us with this. So we're really going step by step through your real estate journey. At this point, you have the properties you're managing, you have this rehab you're working on, and you have an office in Latham. How did you go about splitting your time between all these different locations? Scrambling around. It was, I was in the mode at this point in my life where I was just getting it done. I had, uh, I, at this point, wearing many, many hats. And I was always good about uh, having a very organized to-do list. And um, I was running around scrambling, um, doing a lot of things, which looking back, as I've mentioned in previous episodes, and I'll continue to preach going forward, staying in your lane, getting good at one or two things is super important because I was doing okay at a lot of different things, but... It was, it, it was a, it was a madhouse. Mm -hmm. So now you are in Saratoga County. I think the rest of your investment properties were in Albany County. D did you get the feeling that you wanted to leave Albany County? One of the reasons I ask is because now you prefer to invest in townships and this property is in a township. At that point, were you thinking that you might want to start investing in townships or is this a one-off that you, you found and you wanted to do and go back to Albany? Yeah, we were still comfortable with Albany. At this point, we're, we're looking to continue that cluster effect of getting as many in Albany as we possibly can based on the neighborhoods that we, we started that. Um, so it was just the opportunity of the week. And we were excited about it because it's Saratoga County. We, we didn't get a lot of opportunities in Saratoga County because there just isn't as much inventory, which translates into less opportunity than an inner city. The, the inner cities are, are going to have a lot more housing stock and you know, there's just going to be more opportunity. Absolutely. A lot easier to get into when you're starting. Do you remember any good stories? Was there a family of raccoons in the attic or anything you remember? 
Yeah, it was my first experience with a well. So um, first experience with a well um, and a bad experience with a well. So this property had a well that, you know, we didn't inspect the property. We're buying it at the, the, the foreclosure auction. So we're comfortable enough with the building. We know what we can do with it. We're rolling the dice here because we got it so far under market value. And uh, shortly after we bought it and we started having the need for water, you know, we're realizing that the well is about 12 foot deep and was super inefficient, did not allow for nearly enough water. And uh, once we got tenants in there, we, we had to do a, a drill another well to the, you know, is like had to go down about 200 feet. So it, it cost us another seven, eight thousand dollars. Can you briefly explain for any listeners that don't know the difference between well and public water and just a little bit more onto that? Yeah, the public water and public sewer is key. You know, municipality will literally have a water main, sewer main right at the road in front of the property. And you're able to, uh, well, in most cases on resales, you know, it, it, it laterals in, it taps off of those mains goes right into the basement of the house and, uh, you know, it gets piped right in through the system. And a well, you know, you're going to have a literally a, a drilled situation on the side of the yard that produces water with a well pump and it pumps it into the infrastructure of the house. Same thing with septic. You know, it's, if you don't have municipal sewer, you're going to have a septic tank, which is on the opposite side of the house is the well. That's very key. If anyone's looking at um, that type of property, you really want to make sure that both systems, you have one on one side, one on the other, because they're not supposed to be too close to each other for, you know, sewer, you know, bacteria, potentially getting into the water and so forth. So a septic system is a, a tank with a leach field. And, you know, that, you know, is how your sewer is handled. Yeah, it makes sense. You don't want those right next to each other. So what went wrong with this well? It just wasn't uh, deep enough. There, there just wasn't enough water for someone to live in this house. So it was clear whether we we're going to sell this or rent this. We had to produce water that was going to be suffice for someone willing to pay rent. How did you go about solving that problem? Man, we just hired... Uh, you know, the local well company, you know, unfortunately, there's only two or three options. And, um, you know, you go with who's you're most comfortable with. And uh, in the well business, it's funny, because they can't guarantee anything, they can't give you a price, they're just going to charge you, you know, how far they have to drill down. So, you know, if they drill down 100 feet, it's one price, if they go 200 feet, it's double the price. Was that your first and last well experience? No, I've had a few. I've had a few, um, very little. I, I've dealt with probably, you know, seven or eight different wells over, you know, a long period of time. So I have, I have a pretty good idea of the ups and downs, um, you know, at least to educate me, you know, at, at any point when I do see this type of system. Would you say at this point in your career, it doesn't matter how good the numbers you are, if it's well and it is septic tank, it's not in your criteria and you're staying away from it? Yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan. It would really have to be, you know, super, you know, otherwise, you know, the other characteristics of the property would really have to be really appealing to me to to want to get into a well and septic. Um, maybe not so much on a single family or a two family, but, you know, multifamily. Yeah, I'm not a fan at all. You mentioned that you, you might want to stick this one in the portfolio, but I think you said that you ended up flipping it. What made you change your mind on that? Yeah, just the opportunity, just the opportunity. Once we did get the well system in and we, you know, had, um, you know, the property occupied and rented and just like a lot of single families, not a lot of cash flow. So at this point, we had experienced some flips, some quick cash. So, you know, that that was appealing also. So I believe just after a year and a half or so, we saw the opportunity, knew that we could uh, sell it for a certain amount. And uh, we did that and just made some money. So how long did the renovation take? Well, it was probably uh, two or three months. 
And then you were able to get your tenant in right away. You held it for a little over a year, then flipped it. Yeah, basically. Basically, we had a tenant in there originally, bad well, tenant left. Then we got a new tenant with a good well. You know, they stayed probably a year or so, um, moved out. And I think that's when we took the opportunity to sell it. And at this point, were you still doing one deal at a time? You get I would something, say so. You worked yeah, on I, it. I, I tend to do one deal at a time, even up to this day. I, I've certainly had some overlap, you know, doing a couple of deals at a time. But uh, um, for the most part, you know, one at a time, you know, two at a time is comfortable for me. But uh, yeah, I, I see people doing four or five deals at a time. And, you know, that's a lot. Yeah, it is. Is there anything you would have done differently for this property? No, not really. It's it's. You know, it, it would be stupid for me to say, yeah, I should have known more going into wells and stuff like that. But um, looking back, it, it was just part of the journey. It was part of the learning curve. So was well listed on, on the foreclosure listing or? How did uh, you- there's, there's nothing listed on the foreclosure listing, but there was a previous listing on the MLS for this property. So we were able to get some details. We knew it was a well. Okay. Um, we just, uh, you know, hey, if this has been a property that's been sitting there for 40 years and people have lived there, it must be fine. Mm-hmm. And that's not true. It says well, it doesn't say bad well. <laughs> that's for sure. So is there anything else you want to add for this one? I think that's good on this one. Okay. Well, I look forward to hearing the next one. All right, Stephen. Thank you. Thanks.